on my way to the freedom line. Sit at the welcome table. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. What a different hallelujah. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. What a different day. I'm gonna be stunned. Sunshine, I 
see nothing, nothing at all. But then I hear your sweet voice. Come and then go, come and then go, telling me something. You love me so. Just over the mountain, the peaceful valley. You come to know I may never get there, ever, ever in this lifetime. But sooner or later. What beautiful prelude music by Rob and Elle this morning. Everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Unitarian Church of Staten Island. Welcome from the comfort of your homes, from wherever you are and however you are feeling. Welcome into this virtual space. I hope you find a way to get comfortable in your body, to rest and relax and enter into this time of community and connection. I am the Reverend Emily D. Tarbert, pronouns she, her, hers, and I am speaking live from my apartment here in Marble Hill, Manhattan. Grateful to be with all of you wherever you're coming from, from Staten Island to possibly Florida, upstate New York, so many other places. Thank you for joining us this morning. I begin our service with the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. From his reading, in our hymnal as well, Network of Mutuality. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied to a single garment of destiny. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. Hatred and bitterness can never cure the disease of fear. Only love can do that. We must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation for such a method is love. Before it is too late, we must narrow the gaping chasm between our proclamations of peace and our lowly deeds which precipitate and perpetuate war. One day, we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we must arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. We shall hew out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. There ends our opening words this morning. I now invite Ruth Benson to light our chalice this morning. In the search for truth and the spirit of love, we unite in worship and fellowship. One moment while I light my chalice, our chalice.
And as an extension of this chalice lighting, we will light uh, chalice flames for recent victims of those who have died from police brutality. We know that we cannot list all of the names of those who've been affected, but here are a few of the names that we shall list. One moment, please. For the life of Patrick Warren Sr. For the life of Carl Dorsey III. And for the life of Joshua Feast. May these lights be a symbol of our continued commitment for the work of racial justice and to proclaim everywhere that black lives matter. I now invite you to join us in our opening hymn, Love Will Guide Us. You'll see the lyrics on your screen and our lovely choir director, directors, Kevin and Carolyn Clark will sing and leave for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin and Carolyn. And now I will share a reading for you. It is a reading from an excerpt of Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon, The Birth of a New Nation, given on April 7th of 1957. However, we are lucky due to prosperity and technology that Dr. Martin Luther King will be able to give these excerpts by his voice himself. Um, please give us a moment while we share the video. Greetings, everyone. We learn new things every day, and one of the things that I learned is that almost all of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches are owned and copyrighted by EIM Publishing, a London music producer company. So while I intended to share with you in this video Martin Luther King's own voice, I now invite my wife Ashley to read the reading. I also encourage you to go to the link below in the description, which has the original video I shared with Martin Luther King Jr.'s own voice around his words. Thank you. The aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. The aftermath of nonviolence is redemption. The aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation. The aftermath of violence to emptiness and bitterness. This is the thing I'm concerned about. Let us fight passionately and unrelentingly for the goals of justice and peace. But let us be sure that our hands are clean 
in this struggle. Let us never fight with falsehood and violence and hate and malice, but always fight with love. So that when the day comes that the walls of segregation have completely crumpled in Montgomery, that we will be able to live with people as their brothers and sisters. Oh, my friends, our aim must not be to defeat Mr. Engelhart, not to defeat Mr. Sellers and Mr. Gale and Mr. Parks. Our aim must be to defeat the evil that's in them. But our aim must be to win the friendship of Mr. Gale and Mr. Sellers and Mr. Engelhart. We must come to the point of seeing that our ultimate aim is to live with all men as brothers and sisters under God and not be their enemies or anything that goes with that type of relationship. There's another thing that Ghana reminds us. I'm coming to the conclusion now. Ghana reminds us that freedom never comes on a silver platter. It's never easy. Ghana reminds us that whenever you break out of Egypt, you better get ready for stiff backs. You better get ready for some homes to be bombed. You better get ready for some churches to be bombed. You better get ready for a lot of nasty things to be said about you because you getting out of Egypt and whenever you break loose from Egypt, the initial response of the Egyptian is bitterness. It never comes with ease. It comes only through the hardness and persistence of life. Ghana reminds us of that. You better get ready to go to prison. When I looked out and saw the prime minister there with his prison cap on that night, that reminded me of that fact, that freedom never comes easy. It comes through hard labor and it comes through toll. It comes through hours of despair and disappointment. And that's the way it goes. There is no crown without a cross. I wish we could get to Easter without going to Good Friday, but history tells us that we got to go by Good Friday before we can get to Easter. That's the long story of freedom, isn't it? Before you can get to Canaan, you've got a Red Sea to confront. You have a hardened heart of a Pharaoh to confront. You have the prodigious hilltops of evil in the wilderness to confront. And even when you get up to that promised land, you have giants in the land. And the beautiful thing about it is that there are few people who have been over in the land. They have spied enough to say, even though the giants are there, we can possess the land because we got the internal fiber to stand up amid anything we have to face. But something else came to my mind. God comes in the picture even when the church won't take a stand. God has injected a principle in this universe. God has said that all men must respect the dignity and worth of all human personality. And if you don't do that, I will take change. It seems this morning that I can hear God speaking. I can hear him speaking through the universe saying, be still and know that I am God. And if you don't stop, if you don't straighten up, if you don't stop exploiting people, I'm going to rise up and break the backbone of your power. I just want to sit us, have us sit with those words, which I'm grateful we could hear from the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. this morning. When I think about the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I know one of the main legacies he left was nonviolent resistance. It's one of the first things people talk about that stand out. And I've noticed that people love to lift up these lines about nonviolence and advocate for more peaceful ways of demanding justice. And yet often these lines, like the ones we are, have just heard, are ones that are used against recent protests, particularly if they disrupt or disturb events 
or if they occur alongside riots or damage of property. While it is Dr. King himself who said, quote, riots are the language of the unheard. People often quote King around nonviolence and its notion of the beloved community to try to persuade people to, I don't know, take it easier. Don't, don't be so loud. Get to a more peaceful time or in essence to get over things. But if you listen carefully, that's not what Dr. King is saying. Nor is that the dream of the beloved community or the essence of nonviolence. So I want to take a closer look, particularly with this sermon, Birth of a New Nation, and get a better sense of what the dream of the beloved community is. I'll be upfront that today, I'm speaking this from my identity as a white woman a white woman minister, a relative economic privilege, so I'm trying to keep an ear for what I can learn about racial justice and anti-racism from the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., knowing that he was not speaking with my identity in mind, and knowing that I'm keeping my identity in mind as I'm listening and learning from his example. When Martin Luther King Jr. is speaking to his community, he's speaking to his all-black church in Dexter Avenue Baptist Clear Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And in this sermon, A Birth of a New Nation, he's quite literally talking about the birth of Ghana, a new nation that he had recent travels to in, the 1950, in 1957. He's reporting about the work that happened to make Ghana independent as a former British colony, free of British rule. And what his time there taught him about advocating for freedom, independence, and justice. Unlike the racist film, Birth of a Nation, this sermon, Birth of a New Nation, is focusing on true freedom and justice. And he's speaking to people who are already in the movement of civil rights. People who are tired and frustrated, who have been traumatized and demoralized by repeated instances of racism around their daily lives. It is to this community that Dr. King preaches about nonviolence. He does preach about it as a moral imperative, something that his faith calls him to live out as the only way peace and love will truly win. And the only way true reconciliation may eventually happen at the end of advocating for justice. Nonviolence is part of his moral integrity, part of his call of faith, and an extension of the vision of the beloved community that he dreams of. The brilliance of this tactic of nonviolence in acts of civil disobedience was the violence of racism that it exposed to the world. It was meant to uncover violence. And this can be seen in the example of the protest on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Unlike today, when nearly every protest we have has some sort of cell phone video evidence, this was one of the only protests that was ever televised. And what did people see? Innocent, nonviolent protesters being beaten by police people who were knelt down, who did not raise guns, who did not advocate or jump into self-defense, they did not attack anyone because they maybe knew that any act of violence would be warped into phrases of, again, perpetuating racist violence. We've seen this in, in recent articles around Black Lives Matter protests, things like Michael Brown was, quote, no angel, as reported by the New York Times, even though he was an unarmed teenager going about his life shot by the police. Instead, what was televised back in the 1960s were completely defenseless, honestly, people being beaten by the police. The point and strategy was to persuade a nation that this type of violence is unacceptable and morally reprehensible. It is a call for shame. So, for myself as a white minister, I see part and parcel of the aim of nonviolence is to convert the hearts of white people 
to completely give up our power and to give up our reliance on violence. The fact that violence is an extension of oppression. Nonviolence dreams of a world where there is no violence. However, in reality, nonviolence expects violence to happen. I think this is clear in what we listen to of Dr. King's words, where he preaches about nonviolence and its aim being reconciliation and peace, and then immediately follows it by, I've come to the conclusion now that we should prepare. Right, and I'll, I'll quote these passages. There's another thing that Ghana reminds us. Ghana reminds us that freedom never comes on a silver platter. You better get ready for some homes to be bombed. You better get ready for some churches to be bombed. For whenever you break a loose from Egypt, the initial response of the Egyptian is bitterness. End quote. I find that passage eerily relevant today. When I think about the recent events of the attempted coup on the Capitol. It was last Tuesday where black activists had won decades long struggle to turn the tides of voter engagement against voter suppression to finally turn Georgia blue for the first time in 20 years. It was a day of hard won freedom. And it was on that day that electoral ballots would be counted, a day that represented our democracy. And it was then, it was on that day the white supremacists stormed the Capitol. Just as Dr. King predicted, prepare yourself for bitterness. Prepare for the violence of those who are not used to sharing power. Because the initial response, whenever power, whenever people do find their freedom, is bitterness and violence from those who hold power. So again, in my own identity for myself as a white woman minister, I hear the words of nonviolence as a challenge, a challenge to my own privilege and the systems of racism and oppression that I benefit from. Will there ever be a time where white people ever stop fully perpetuating violence? The violence that the marginalized community, the violence that Dr. King and other Black people in America live with every single day, will there be a day where power does not have to mean oppression and violence, where we reinvent what we know about how we live? I am unsure of an answer to this question, but I want to raise it to sit with it and the power it shows. Now you may be wondering why I titled this sermon Dream of a Beloved Community when I've spent all this time talking about nonviolence. Well, it's because a nonviolent world is the dream of the beloved community. A dream so desperately fought for and imagined yet never taken as real. A world that really is divested of power structures. A world where we truly are free and fully equal. The beloved community is a religious concept. It is an idea based in Dr. King's Christian faith. It doesn't mean it's only a Christian concept. It just means that it's an extension of how Dr. King understood his faith, taken from words like what we can find in the Lord's Prayer, quote, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For Dr. King, this idea of God's love and justice done on earth is the dream of the beloved community. A community where we're, we don't look for powers and principalities that are made by human ego or human fallacy, but are held together reflecting the love, justice, and peace of the holy. On the King Center's website, this is what they say the philosophy of the beloved community is, and I quote, Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth. In the beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated 
because international standards of human decency will not allow it. Racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of humanity. In the beloved community, international disputes will be resolved by peaceful conflict resolution and reconciliation of adversaries instead of military power. Love and trust will triumph over fear and hatred. Peace with justice will prevail over war and military conflict. End quote. That is quite the vision. And that means a divestment from everything we think is power or control. Everything we assume is a hierarchy is a complete commitment against any sources of power or violence. It would take living in a world where there isn't a military budget, where weapons aren't created, where peace is actually achievable. And Dr. King believes this because he had a faith that showed that freedom was possible. As he says in, in the words we shared, he uses the allegories of his faith to talk about it. The story of Easter, the story of Exodus as a way to say the road is hard, but freedom exists. But remember, he's saying all of this in a sermon about his recent travels to Ghana. Ghana, a country that just won their independence. He literally has a concrete example of a people who won their independence, who became free. So he knows by the example of Ghana, it is possible to get to a place where powers are divested, where freedom is realized. And he holds that dream up for America. A place where we can maybe someday become a true democracy. This global dream is a spiritual mandate. It is a calling based in faith, an understanding that humanity can, despite all that we've done, we can live in a way that is divested of power or control over others. That truly humanity and human beings can live as one global family. It is possible. And I find this message reflected in our Unitarian Universalist faith. Our Unitarian Universalist principles point to this dream of global community, of democracy, of sharing each other's voices, of caring for each other across difference. Our Unitarian and Universalist theologians of the past also shared this vision of humanity, whether it's from our humanist elders who believe that humanity can live into a, a place of peace and justice, or whether it is by Unitarian theologians like Theodore Parker, who Dr. King quoted in his speech, or over time, in this famous quote, the moral arc of the universe is long, but ultimately bends towards justice. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a history of pointing towards this vision of what humanity can be together. And in the last few years, to continue to share in the stream of the beloved community, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalists and others have proposed an eighth principle for the UUA and Unitarian Universalism to adopt. This eighth principle would read as follows. Quote, We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other impressions in ourselves and in our institutions. What I find so beautiful about this principle is that I feel it really ties together all of the strings of Dr. King's philosophy. Proclaiming that the vision of the beloved community rests directly in the divestment of white supremacy and oppressions in order for it to become true. It speaks to truly embodying a nonviolent world by dismantling the violence and power and control 
of the systems that we sit in. And so as we hold this principle and as we think about these things, I hope that myself as a Unitarian Versalist, and I invite all of you to continue to advocate for this dream, to believe that it is still possible, no matter the instances of violence we may witness in our lives, no matter how impossible it seems, that it really is possible for us as humans to live in a different way. For myself, I say, may I, in my own small way, continue to divest in the power and systems that perpetuate violence. I hope all of us will do this together so that one day we may see that mountaintop together. We can see into the valley of the beloved community that peace really is possible. May it be so. And amen. And now is the time in our service for our offertory. I invite you as, as you can or as you're willing and able to please give to our community. We know it is the gifts of all of us that help to make this community possible. You'll see the links are up on the page. Um, try to get them posted in the chat and please enjoy this special offertory. This offertory was a video that's been given permission to share by a wonderful musician, Leah Morris, uh, who speaks of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and nonviolence. Please enjoy. <clears throat> Morally, I was led to nonviolence because I felt that it was the best moral way to deal with the problem. We were seeking to establish a just society. And uh, it was my feeling then and it is my feeling now that uh, violence is certainly much more uh, socially destructive and it creates many more social problems than it solves. So I was led to nonviolence for deep moral reasons. And I turned to it because I felt that it was the morally excellent way to deal with the problem of racial injustice in our country. There is no freedom, the wise men said, let justice roll down. Roll down when the poor cry out for shelter and bread. Let justice roll down like a mighty stream. Oh, children, don't you get we re walk together, believe in the dream. When the way gets rough, we'll make a new way. Let justice roll down like a mighty stream. Hatred will never drive out hate Let love roll down, roll down Remember our hearts can make us great Let love roll down like a mighty stream Oh, children, don't you get we re-walk Together believe in the dream When the way gets rough, we'll make a new way let your love roll down like a mighty stream When brutality threatens our daughters and sons Let peace roll down, roll down May our voices rise up louder than the guns Let peace roll down like a mighty stream Oh, children, don't you get we re-walk Together, believe in the dream When the way gets rough We'll make a new way And let peace roll down Like a mighty stream Step by step One by one Let justice roll down Roll down They can kill the prophet 
But the dream lives on Let justice roll down Like a mighty stream Oh, children, don't you carry me Walk together, believe in the dream When the way gets rough We'll make a new way And let justice roll down Like a mighty stream to it because I felt that it was the morally excellent way to deal with the problem of racial injustice in our country. I now invite us to sing our final hymn, Come and Go With Me to That Land, which Kevin and Carolyn will sing as I share the lyrics on the screen. One moment while I share those lyrics. <clears throat> morally. Go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land where I'm bound. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land where I'm bound. There'll be freedom in the Land. There'll be freedom in that land. There'll be freedom in that land where I'm bound. There'll be freedom in that land. There'll be freedom in that land. There'll be freedom in that land where I'm so much kevin and carolyn and now i invite ruth benson if i can find you on my screen there you are i invite ruth benson to extinguish our chalice this morning we extinguish this flame but not the light of truth the warmth of community the fire of commitment for these we carry in our hearts until we are together again I end this service with a benediction of a prayer that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote himself. I say these words with his legacy in mind. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together pray together, sing together, and live together until that day when all God's children will rejoice in one common band of humanity. May it be so, and amen. <laughs>